Welcome to the Ballpark Digest Broadcaster Chat. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler up in the Old English D, joined by Mick Gillespie and the Cubs and the Tennessee Smokies, rocking it, and Kevin Reichard of Ballpark Digest. Let's begin with you, Mick. How are you? I'm doing good. I missed you guys last week. I've been busy. Uh, college football is now in full swing, you know, so I've actually got to do some work. Um, hopefully I'll get paid soon, but at least I'm, uh, you know, I'm working and that's a good thing. I've enjoyed, uh, you know, watching the playoffs. Got a lot to talk about there. And, uh, you know, there's so many different news tidbits, I think, that have dropped since I was here last. So looking forward to talking to you guys today. Kevin Reichardt, happy book release day. It is book release day. The spring training guide for Florida is out. Now we can turn our attention to the major league guide and uh, two other titles for the spring. So it's pretty exciting. Three other titles for the spring, excuse me. So it's pretty exciting around here. Uh, a sort of frenzy of activity in a, in, a, in a strange environment. So just plugging away. <laughs> There's the frenzy of activity at the major league level with game, 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 game last week. And then this week, we've just started things up. Meanwhile, checking in at the minor league level, there were goings on last week in the Appalachian League and developments even after you and I talked. What's the latest that you've heard? The latest is they're still working out the details on the uh, transition of the Appy League from a uh, major league owned league to a locally operated and presumably controlled league. Um, Mark Ryan was actually covering the press conference while we were on our call last week. He was there. He talked with uh, the principals involved. Uh, didn't get a lot of answers to a lot of things. Uh, followed up, he and I both. And uh, to say that the Appy League situation is a little, little thinly sourced is, uh, is, is an understatement. Because when they made the announcements, there was no final plan over who actually would be owning the Appy League teams besides some, lo some local operators. Not all the local operators will be involved. So they've got to find new operators in Kingsport and uh, Danville. They need to figure out how much money they're going to give these teams between Major League Baseball and uh, USA Baseball. They promised money, but so far we, we haven't heard the specifics. So I, I, I'm really starting to fear that this is more a PR move than it was an actual operating strategy. It sounds similar to me about what went on with the independent leagues, with them announcing, hey, we're now partnered up with Major League Baseball. All right, what does that mean? What are the specifics? And, well, and we still don't know. You know, some of my friend in indie leagues I see posting in social media that it means that Major League Baseball is going to be giving them a lot of money. And it's like, friends, you do not know Major League Baseball. They don't give you a lot of money on any level. So the, th the thought that, that, you know, the Windy City team's going to all of a sudden be the beneficiary of hundreds of thousands of dollars in new equipment is, is not very plausible if you've ever dealt with the New York people before. So it, there's a lot of strangeness out, out there. You know, to their credit, Major League Baseball's, I think, honestly trying to come up with a game plan. But they, they, every indication is they've been way over their heads so far in actual commitments versus lovely promises. Mick, I know your personal ties with the Appalachian League. Was there anything that you were hearing coming out with the big announcement last week? Well, I think they're really excited about having baseball. I mean, they were concerned that, that they weren't um, going to have all those teams together. But, you know, I, I started to kind of get the feeling that they were going to be able to keep the league together, that it wasn't going to be, you know, part of another uh, college would bat league, but that they would have their own and that Major League Baseball would be a big part of that. I think what Major League Baseball is trying to do is, you know, start with these like, high school kids and then some way or the other follow them up through the draft. The level of baseball probably is going to be better in the Appy League with college kids. Uh, you know, I've watched those games and, and um, you know, you're talking about um, kids that were straight out of high school. I know these will be kids that have played a year or two in college. Uh, they'll be top prospects that have to be, in, to, to be invited. And so USA Baseball will, uh, from what I understand, be part of helping pick the, the players that would, um, you know, that, that would be invited. Uh, you know, I look at what happened in the Supreme Court yesterday where, you know, minor league baseball players are suing over money. 
Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if minor league baseball as a whole continues to contract less players, less teams, less games, probably more deals like this. Um, I'm not excited about the direction that this whole thing is going, but I understand it uh, from a business aspect for baseball because, you know, they're, they're uh, a lot less culpable for these teams. You know, they're just college kids coming out there. You don't have to plan, pay them a salary. You know, it's, it's volunteer, right? So um, basically I think what you're going to have is it's going to be a developmental league of college kids. And then I, I think that they'll try to connect different, you know, opportunities like this for some of the best players in, uh, you know, in amateur baseball and give the scouts an opportunity to follow those guys right up into the draft. So, you know, that that's part of it. You know, who's going to own the teams? Somebody will figure that out. You know, I mean, uh, you know, a couple teams maybe don't have anyone now, but they'll have operators at least at first, and we'll see what happens. You know, are they able to make money? You know, that's a big part of it. Some teams do, some teams don't. I mean, you're talking about a very thin margin for money making at, at, at the, this level of baseball. You know, I, I don't – been around the game a long time, um, and the players have this misconception that these teams make a mint, you know. Some of them do. You know, some, I don't even know a mint, but they, some make a profit. A lot of them, you know, like they, they're either a tax write-off or, <laughs> or they take a loss, you know, at this level. You don't play that many games, you know, it's, and, and even without paying the players. You know, when Major League Baseball was paying them, then they'll be free again too. It's really tough when you're paying people to be out there – to work the concessions, you're, you're buying food, you're dealing with weather issues. Um, you know, not a lot of places are, are, are really supported, you know, like, like you take Johnson city, they have great, great support, you know, Pulaski has great support. Um, you know, but Kingsport and Elizabethan, you know, like they've got some good fans, some loyal fans, but, but, you know, not a Monday night might only have a few hundred people, you know, like, so, you got to figure out how to make all that work, um, you know, financially for whoever invests in this. I, I'm guessing they'll have to rename all these teams. Sure. You know, some of them have the same name forever, right? But they're not the Cardinals anymore in Johnson City, right? This is, the, you know, so what, what are the team names going to be like? And then you get into issues like the Redskins had, which I think is an interesting topic too. You know, you, you can't even have a name the team contest because – you know, some troll is going to get on there and copyright all your names. Major League Baseball is already working on the logos. Minor League Baseball has been shut out totally. This is a process that's been going on with the New York offices with the branding, interestingly enough. And I believe New York will control the trademarks as well. So Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they will. Part of this. Um, the, the, the economics of the Appy League, and, and, and I, if you really are interested – and you're watching this, I would encourage you to go to the site and read Mark Krein's article because Mark is a former GM in Burlington. He was also a founder of the Coastal Plain League. So he knows the economics inside and out. Mm -hmm. Major League Baseball teams subsidize Appy League teams to the tune of 200 grand a year with costs of, and that's not the player costs. That's purely the costs of coaching, meals, hotels, et cetera. So if you're running uh, a Burlington, you all of a sudden have to figure out how to gin up $200,000 in revenue, new revenue, to cover mm -hmm. the costs that the major league teams were, were um, paying for. And the other thing is major league right. baseball is working toward a licensing model. You know, you don't have a franchise anymore. You have a license. You got to pay your licensing fees to major league baseball. And, and if they're going to control all of your marks, you are double paying for that. So, I, I, you know, the economics, I, I'm not so sure quite so magical as Major League Baseball would, would allow us to believe. Um, you know, a, a couple of Appy League owners, uh, operators have all of a sudden said, wait a minute. It was all nice and magic when we were picking team names. Um, but now, now you're getting to the nitty gritty of who's paying for stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, it's not quite as attractive a proposition. And if this lack of foresight is what's going on in the Appy League, just imagine how it's going to play out in the, uh, in the, in the full season leagues, which right. some owners have already emailed and said it's going to be a sad off season. It's going to be a very sad off season as they figure, find out exactly how much it's going to cost them to, to run a team. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if, say, a Kingsport couldn't find an operator 
Danville probably. That's actually not a bad market, but if uh, if you if you have to pay money to be part of the Appy League and you do in the Coastal Plain anyway, and the subsidies aren't nearly as much as as they say they're going to be, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, and by the way, there's only a three-year commitment to this. This is not a long-term deal. This is three years now. So mm -hmm. in order to three years, MLB and USA Baseball can take their Jacks and, and run marbles and run down to the next playground. Yeah, I, I'm really concerned about the overall what the next thing is going to be with the big with the you know the full season leagues. You know, I think there's going to be some teams that are that think they're in that are out. You know, when when this thing sh shuffles through, and I also think that there's a possibility that there's a lot less games. You know, there's been complaining from players for a long time about they don't get enough days off. They don't get enough money. And, you know, do you want to play a hundred game season instead of 140 or 120 instead of 140? You know, I don't know. I mean, like, I, but I think that there's a good possibility that the season's going to get shrunk uh, for the full season teams. You know I mean? Like they're, they're restructuring this whole thing. Um, I thought the system was pretty good the way that it was, but, you know, I'm also not getting sued, you know, in Supreme Court right now. And who knows what that's going to look like. Um, it, it, this thing could be totally different when it's all said and done. Unfortunately, I, I thought it was pretty good. I've been around it for a long time. You know, you give a lot of guys opportunities to, to follow their dream. And, um, you know, and, and it's like these, the, the 4A guys, you could walk away from baseball at any minute if you didn't like the pay, if you didn't like the opportunity. You know, what they've done is that they're stripping a lot of other people away from their chance to follow their dream because there's just going to be a lot less people involved in this. It's going to be all about the big prospects, you know, the, you know, the Ryan Friels of the world that, that just, you know, bust their butts and, you know, the David Bodies might not get a chance anymore. And that's a shame, you know, and I'm not saying that they're going to, you know, for every Mike Piazza, there's, you know, million guys that don't make it, but at least they have a chance to. I, might be um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, maybe it won't be as bad as I think. I, I What's thought that? I read that the Supreme Court declined to hear Major League Baseball's appeal. Yes. Mm -mm, they're, yeah, so which, which that means they can be sued. So that it, it didn't actually get into the Supreme Court docket exactly. Right, and which was not unexpected given how pro, you know, it, it, it's a weird philosophical issue for the Supreme Court to, to go near because essentially it's a minimum wage pay case. It's L&E basic stuff. So it's gonna- make, Yeah, right? and that's said it backwards, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it's gonna have a huge impact potentially. Now, I, I think you're right in that we're going to see different structures. We're already, they're already talking about, you know, how camp leagues are going to act, splitting seasons, you know, the, the Northwest League will, will basically be a short season league, even though they'll be technically a long season league because players will not start the season up, up north in, the, in April and May. They'll stay camps and in camp for those, those two months. And the same with this pitched Mid-Atlantic League going on. So there's going to be a lot of, a lot of strange scheduling out there and, and in terms of season length. And then there's, there's talk about extending spring training for three weeks and just having the minor leaguers participate the last three weeks. To make Kevin, you and I had discussed, too. Yeah, we had discussed this before in prior years about how if you wiped the slate clean and you started anew, what were different things that you would try to focus on? What were different things that you would try to fix? And a lot of that it seems to me is based upon weather that if you can't play games in the Pacific Northwest in these months, then you can't play games. If you can't play games in New York or in Wisconsin or wherever it might be in April, then you just have to push back the season. So it seems to me that there are a lot of different logistics that they're trying to fix all at once. Yeah, imagine an April 8th opener in Spokane. Woo-hoo, boy, they'll sell a lot of hot chocolate, that's for sure. Gotta go sleeveless. <laughs> got it no long sleeves, right? If you're a pitcher, you got to go out there just as you are. Yeah, we'll see who they end up with um, as an affiliate, which will be a – that's just what you want, a West Coast team playing in the snow in Spokane in April. So that'll be amazing. Because that's the whole point of the new Northwest League is they're going to be farm teams for the West Coast League. 
West Coast teams to uh, come down and travel. It's so funny to me because the Blue Jays would always tell the players whenever they'd complain about the cold in Michigan, hey, you want to play crucial games in Boston or in New York in April or in October? Figure it out. But, you know, yeah. by and large, we still don't want the players playing in the cold because minor league players, the hitters don't like to get jammed. So they're swinging early and they're desperately trying to make contact and they're trying to keep the ball off the handle, trying to keep it toward the end of the bat. And the pitchers have no feel for their breaking stuff. They can't feel the ball. So it, it makes for a very unusual, atypical baseball game where I can't trust what I see until the weather warms up. And then I go, oh, turns out this guy can hit. Or it turns out this guy can actually spin some secondary stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, remember when we first started, you know, how excited everyone was to, to be part of a team? And, you know, the people would complain about the long bus trips if the place you went to was like when we played um, the Carolina Mudcats and they had us in a, a, a horrible hotel. I mean, it was emb embarrassing to the point where you had prostitutes that were you know in the facility and bed bugs and you know and and roaches and everything else and they when they switched us to a nice hotel and that and, and that place I never heard another complaint about going on that trip the bus or anything and then now all of a sudden you know within the last five years it's like everybody's got a problem with the bus everybody's got a problem with the food everybody's got a problem with this and how many games and how many days off and yeah I think the thing that bugs me the most is like you, you go in the clubhouse when it's raining and everybody's ready for the game not to be played, you know, it's like there's a million people that would love to be in your spot. They'd love to ride the bus. They'd love to be playing baseball for a living. You know, they, they would love to eat the food that you're not, that you don't want and, and have the experience. And, and I just feel like, um, you know, and I'm not trying to generalize because it's not every person, but it's just this overall thing. And this lawsuit kind of, to me, is part of that. Uh, just how people have changed, you know, generations have changed. I first got there and it was, it was more blue collar, you know, it was like, Hey man, I'm, I'm, I'm living the dream every day and people complain, but it was more joking. You know, it's just gotten a lot more serious over the last like five years. And, it, and to me, it, to be perfectly honest with you, it's entitlement. You know, there's so much entitlement now. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen with my career. Or I don't know what's going to happen with your guys' career. Everything's different now with Corona. But I've been just blessed to be around the game every single day and meet the people that I've gotten to meet and call games for a living. Uh, you know, do I like riding the bus? No, I drive some. But you know what? It's not the end of the world for me. I can ride the bus. You know, do I want to, you know, eat crappy food sometimes? No. But you know what? At the end of the day, I'm getting to watch baseball – and I could walk away from it anytime I want. Um, I'm curious to see what Major League Baseball's game plan is because, I mean, I, they have to have a game plan, right? I mean, they have to have, like, hey, here's – they might not have told us, but they – you would – yeah, right, I know. that's But, but I mean, I'm, I give them the benefit of the doubt. Than you think there is they're, – they're going back and forth. I've talked to people – uh, on the negotiating committee and very close to it. There's far less of a game plan going on than, than you would think. Part of it is, is these aren't issues that are easily solved in terms of travel, in terms of alignments, in terms of trying to change a minor league system that was developed first when everyone took the railway to different cities. So it's, uh, the enormity of the task is, is a little bit more complicated than Major League Baseball thought. You know. I'm going to go even more deeply into it. Remember when the Chicago Cubs developed their college of coaches in the 1960s yeah. and yeah. they rotated manager and coach and just everyone? That was actually the predecessor for what we're seeing right now. And I think what major league teams are doing now compared to when I first entered minor league baseball is it is so hands-on at every single level and every single team and wherever they can get to. When I first joined you had your manager, the pitching coach, the hitting coach, the trainer. And that was mm -hmm. it. And the trainer had yeah. to handle everything. And we mm -hmm. rarely saw rovers. And unless we were in a prime city where it was convenient, we didn't see rehabbers. Guys were just sent in, and the manager would just call in with a report. And now with all the rovers who come in and the scouts who come in and everyone else, all the different support staff that comes in and is checking, and the mental performance team, 
it is so hands-on with these players constantly. What is their individual performance plan? What are they doing on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis? Strength and conditioning plan, the dietetics plan, the, every single individual plan. They are hands-on with these guys. They're right in. They've got the cameras and the equipment. They can watch every single pitch and every single swing from every single game, and they're breaking it down whether wherever they are, whether they need to fly in. And so because they're so hands-on, they need their own increased convenience. They need their own technology wherever they play and onward. It is right from that college of coaches where the Cubs said, we need the, all of these guys involved with every single thing. We have gone to the extreme with that for better or for worse. Yeah, for worse. I mean, look, we get, we get rid of scouts, you know, I mean, like, we, we don't need scouting anymore. I mean, we've got, you know, rap Soto that we can put in front of the guy and watch him hit. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I, you know, I watch all this stuff and I see teams that fundamentally stink. No one can bunt the ball anymore. You can shift because no one's good enough at hitting the ball or the other way anymore. Where I mean, like you, you can take a guy that would have maybe like a, you know, a three, 25 batting average and turn them into a 225 hitter, you know, because they don't have any skill sets to go the other way. And we don't really work on that enough in the minor leagues, you know, and maybe all the way up through, I mean, maybe this, this new, you know, following guys from the time that they're in high school thing will help that out. But, um, you know, with all the technology and everything else that's going on, you know, like you see a Nick Madrigal and you're like, oh man, here's, you know, here's somebody that gets it. Like I watched this guy play the game. I'm like, okay. And you know why? Because he's old school. He just plays the game. Look, if you're going to shift him, he's going to hit it the other way. You know, he was one of my favorite players last year in the Southern League, a uh, White Sox prospect, uh, you know, and Nico Horner who, you know, who gets it. Um, but they drafted the players getting it. it's not like they taught them how to get there um you know i get it the technology's good but man i i don't like the direction that the game's going at all right now you know but it's very circular in a way because I, we romanticize the days of scouting and bird dogging and whatnot but so in the course of researching one of the books that's coming out in the spring i spent some time in sioux falls at the northern league archives the original northern league, class D. right and inside there are all the scouting reports on potential players. And it's fascinating to look through how little work scouts put into actually evaluating players. I found Craig Cusick's uh, scouting report. Cusick replaced uh, Harmon Killerwood first base for the Twins. Two words, can hit. That was the scouting report. I mean, let's, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful to think that there used to be this old-time great system but that was the scouting report. Twins signed, drafted, and signed him. Um, and they taught him how to play. And I think we're getting back to that in a way, that they're being we're, – we're, major league teams expect to teach players how to play. I've seen those reports, but I also think that, you know, if you're a scout, maybe you tell whoever in person what you really thought. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, it's like, hey, I, I mean, I've seen him. Like, some of them, like, you know, sign this guy. He's going to be great. You know, it's like, but but don't you think that they would have gotten together in person and, you know, and someone would have said, hey, you know, what what makes him a great hitter? I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there. Well, a bird dogger, uh, that's their financial incentive to say to sign someone. That's their bonus, too. So, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, it, 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 was a, it was a weird system of financial incentives that didn't always work. Um, and I'm sure you're right. There were all undoubtedly phone calls and off-season chats and whatnot. But it's it's kind of surprising how skimpy those scouting reports for future major leaguers were. Uh, when you yeah. look at some of the names, I mean, you look at a Jim Palmer that came through Aberdeen in that league, very little scouting on him until he rose to higher leagues. So there's, there's the impasse. Yeah. I took this moment, I was Googling up an old Hank Aaron scouting report because I'm going, I wonder what they said about Hammer and Hank. Great pair of hands. Seems relaxed at all times and a good wrist hitter. Needs experience, et cetera. Yeah, um, it's, it really is interesting to see how those old scouting reports were made out and what was said. Well, well here's, and, and here's an issue, and I know that this is an issue. Um, there's an issue right now, too, where they have so much information that it's difficult for 
the teams to, to process it all. And I promise you that. And I know this is true. I just don't want to get into why I know. But I, well, I'll everyone, tell you that. Everyone knows. They, but they, I've, they, I've been told that, yeah. And it's like the guys slip through, and it's because they've got so much information now. <laughs> you have to have, like, data processors to go through it all. Yeah. You know, you're writing up, like, you know, 400 guys, 500 guys, 1,000 guys. You know, how many guys are you going to write up? And then who's going to go back over it and look at it? And then they've got to report to someone else who's got to report to someone else. And, you know, next thing you know, you know, you had a, 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 you know, a first or second round pick on a guy, uh, you know, for whatever reason, and no one even saw the report. And now they're a star with another team, one of your oppositions, you know, and I know that that happens, you know, and so you kind of, and, you know, how do you process all that? Yeah, I mean, that, but that's very, that's a tech thing, not a baseball thing. In tech, in the tech world, it's very common to gather up as much data as you can grab, even if you don't know how you're going to use it someday. Yeah. Because at some point, someone from Fangraphs is going to look back five years and go, there's the trait that we should have been looking for back yeah. then. But we didn't know about it then. So that, you're absolutely right. It, 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 the noise to useful information ratio is really high these days. And I, and I think they know that. You know, there were some, there's been some ads on Fangraphs lately for data analysts. And, and part of the job description has been, help us figure out what the hell's going on here. Well, but there's not that much money. So they're looking for really good work from really smart people putting in really long hours. But what are you compensating them for that? And that's at so many different levels of baseball. Mick, you talked about scouts losing their jobs. It's the whole, if there's not that much money at certain levels to pay, but you're looking for exceptional work, that's a really difficult match to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then add in all the layoffs. You know, uh, all the way through every team, you know, and it, and it, those layoffs are going to go with the people that they feel like are the least important and out you go. And so, you know, look around baseball and, and all the, the, the really great scouts and other personnel that right now are out because we don't have fans at the games and without fans in the game spending money, there is no money for a lot of stuff. And that even includes, you know, I saw that the Cubs, uh, laid off 60 people some of those my friends you know um and they and they waited you know a lot of teams did that a long time ago it just I think if there was anything that we learned from this and I, I really hope the message gets to the bulk of the players is just how important the fans are the people that pay for the tickets you know the people that pay the price for all of us to get to be involved in this that's another thing that I feel like has changed in this entitlement era, you know, where it's like you, it, 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 they don't want to sign an autograph. They don't want to see, you know, like the, 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 the middle reliever that is never going to make it to the big leagues. And this is from a crusty vet like me that knows I can watch you pitch and I'll tell you right away. If you have a chance, I, I don't, I'm, I didn't draft you. I, I don't, I just watch the games every day. I, I got no dog in the fight, but I can tell, I'd say 90% of the time I can tell if you're going to make it, especially if you're on the team I'm watching because you just know. And some of those guys don't want to sit in the table for 15 minutes before the game and sign autographs. Like they're too busy. You know, it's like they, they're, and it goes all the way through. Then you get some guys that love to do it, you know, and then you see the same guy sitting out there because, he just jump likes to do it, you know, like this, you'll see the same guy signing autographs because he just, you know, fills in for his buddy all the time. And my thought on that is always, you know, you just don't know how lucky you are that someone wants you to write your name on a baseball or on a, on a card, you know, like that someone's spending their hard earned money to give you a chance to run around in that uniform. That is, this is as good as it's going to get. And you're so naive to that, that, you know, you're missing out. And I think there's guys in the big leagues that are, that are superstars that don't get that, you know, and I don't want to pick on any individuals um, because that's not what I'm on here for, but I'm, I'm telling you, I see it. Even guys I have a lot of respect for it surprises me sometimes. You know, when I, when I see the way that they, they've changed from just the time that we had them in double A until they, they get to the big leagues. And I know, look, it's a, there's a lot of, um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of demands on someone when they're a baseball player because so many people look up to them. But at the same time, uh, without those fans, 
Yeah, it hasn't really gotten to the players yet. It's just starting to creep up there, but their money is going to go down too. And and I think that when you get hit in your pocket, sometimes you you know you you realize. And I'm not talking about everybody, but I'm talking about a good group of them. That 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 guy that's yelling for your autograph, or that little seven year old that's sitting there wearing your jersey, um, take the time to walk over to him, you know, and and sign an autograph or take a picture if you can, you know, like because it goes a long way. It does. It goes a long way towards helping the game. You know, I watched Ryan Sandberg sign autographs after Smokey's games for before Smokey's games for an hour. I saw Ben Zobris sign every single autograph after a, a rehab game last year. And I just thought to myself, like, it's these guys that keep this game going. People like Ben Zobris. I, I think that a huge lesson of this has been about how little major league baseball actually cares about creating new fans and yeah. how little major league baseball has done to increase how many people love the game of baseball. This has been a point in time where we're losing minor league baseball teams. Um, there was no minor league baseball season. The negotiations to actually get a season started just kept on dragging on month after month with no urgency the institution of the extra inning rule, the institution of the DH in the National League, the institution of a number of different things that it all seemed to me alienated a lot of different fans. Whether you're taking away teams from cities, whether you're simply saying to fans, this is not the baseball that you are able to recognize anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that what has sold baseball this summer has been the games, has been watching the games and going, oh man, that Fernando Tatis Jr. is something. But it hasn't been Major League Baseball all capitalized that has done its best for baseball. Yeah, and look, I, I mean, and I know some people aren't going to like me saying this, but it's true. You know, also they, they got involved politically at the beginning of the year and had logos and look, whether you agree, baseball's not before. And so the three of us may sit here and go, hey, look, we agree with this cause but then there's going to be three other people that don't, you know, and it's an entertainment thing. Like it, it's, it's like, look, we're trying to bring everybody into this, you know, not drive people away. I've talked to people that say I'm never watching a major league game again, you know? And it's like, that's the same thing. I mean, whether you agree or you disagree, like what if it was something that you, we disagreed with and then they did that, you know, and then you're, you're pissed off because you're like, well, these guys are getting political on this end of it. The safest thing, my grandfather used to do this, there would always be like some kind of riff in the family, and he just never got involved. And one day I was like, Pop, why, you never say anything. And he's like, yeah, because you can't win, you know. Like just, you know, let, let them deal with it and work itself out. You know, he just kind of wanted to be a Switzerland. And, um, you know, and I think that's smart. You know, like we, we all have these different beliefs, but I, I feel like that hurts the game too. You know, I really do. I look at the TV ratings of sports right now and they're so low. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just, and I, you know, and I asked people on Twitter, I said, what do you guys think about this? You know, was this a good idea? Was this a bad idea? You're not going to watch the game, you know, and the majority of the people on my Twitter were like, no, we, you know, we were going to watch the game, you know, but, it was still like 70 to 30, you know, if you lose 30%, I mean, that's a pretty big chunk of your fans, right? I mean, if that was the case across the board. And then I, I was just looking at something yesterday and it was like right around like 30% lower than last year. And the NBA is really low right now, you know? Okay. About um, that drop, Mick, did you see the Boston Red Sox TV ratings came out? And <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different story. Though. Well, they, they were, it could have been part of that. It also could have been part of the fact that they they just cursed themselves again. You know, like they had the curse of the Bambino. Now it's the, the curse of Mookie, right? Yeah. If you're thinking about the <laughs> most diehard baseball fan bases in the country, how could you hurt the Boston baseball fan base? You can't lose Boston baseball fans. And they lost a lot of Boston baseball fans. Kevin, do you have a lesson that you're taking away from this year? My lesson is I think all these moves actually work. The ratings are actually up 4%. There was a, a Forbes story today about that, that ratings are actually up this year over last. And, you know, when, when you're playing a demographics game like baseball is, 
sometimes you got to lose the old conservatives to gain in the young people who are actually going to go to games. Um, it, it's all, you know, I hate, it, it's all part of the dirty monetization of, of, of professional sports, but it's always been about the monetization of professional sports. You know, in the early days, baseball had to be a mass market offering because that's all anyone was a mass market offering today. You can say if you're major league, you know, we'll lose, we'll lose some of the older demographics that TV and radio don't want to reach. We'll have a smaller core audience of the demographic fabrics that, that TV wants to reach. And the same with the NBA. They're, they're clearly gone after a demographic that, that the, the league can sell to its sponsors and media partners. And, and, and one final thought, every, every poll, the, every study of people who say, I'll never watch something again because of X, they almost always come back and watch. They make the threat, it's idle, they come back. So, you know, it's, it, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure that the issues with baseball today were, were caused by any, anything political. Same with baseball. Uh, did you stop watching, stop watching Washington, Jesse? No, no. I am so in with my <laughs> Washington football team. And for year after year after year, I've hated Daniel Snyder, Bruce Allen, just the mess that they do and how embarrassing they are. And yet I am so in every single season, every game on Sunday. And you're not alone. I worked in, in the Redskins market covering the Redskins. The hardcore fans are going to be there. You know, they, they, they didn't love the team because of any chance or tomahawk crap. They loved the team because it was Washington's team in a unique environment. It's so awful to, be, to tell my wife, I'm going into this game on Sunday. I know we're going to lose to the Ravens. I hope it's not by 40. <laughs> it was great. But I'm it still going to watch. <laughs> Loved it. Loved it. Look, the story I read, and I've just pulled it up, 11% decline in ratings overall baseball, 58% Red Sox decline. So, I mean, like, that that's the story I read. I guess everyone has a different, uh, you know, kind of a different right. know, take Forbes, on that. But Forbes included the, the, the local TV ratings as well as the streaming because Nielsen, Nielsen operates it a few different ways. And, yeah, I mean, I stream, I'm a streamer. I watch and when them you, all. When you have the 11%, that's strictly on TBS and ESPN, I believe, which may say more about ESPN and TBS than it does about people. And I watch baseball streaming exclusively as well. I'm with you. So, I mean, I watch pretty much every game on Marquee. So and my, 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 uh, I, I was definitely on the uh, other side of things. I've never watched more Major League Baseball you know, and, and my, since I was a kid, really, since I've been out of it. And by the way, that was a great Ravens game. You can always jump over to the Ravens, Jesse. I mean, like. I'm not a front runner. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is I, I saw this kind of getting on this for a second. I saw this graph that said, like, despite the Redskins or the Washington team or whatever, their terrible play and all this other stuff, they're still the most popular team in the area. Like, if you put the state up there and D.C. and Virginia, there's, like, these small purple pockets, and mostly around Baltimore and in a couple other places. But, um, you know, for being as bad as they've been for such a long time, still have a really strong fan base. Yeah, if they would go 8-8, eight and eight, imagine how popular they'd be then. Uh, yeah, really. To, get to something that happened in baseball where it was great TV – but the baseball fan in me, the person who works in baseball, was a big get-off-my-lawn reaction to it. I think it was Ramon Laureano, the Oakland Athletic, who was mic'd up for an in-game interview during the White Sox game when there was a double that was hit to the wall, and he swore on a live mic on television as he went to track it down and get it in. I'm going as a baseball fan. This is a playoff game. These guys... Their intensity is ratcheted all the way up. Every pitch matters. Every play matters. Why are you miking this guy up right now? But yeah. on the other hand, that's great television. Yeah, yeah. I, I was on the, I, I, I was on the uncomfortable side of that. You know, like I, I, I was like, oof. You know, I've got two teenage girls here at home. I hear worse every day from both of them. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, oh, I, it wasn't that the, part of it. It the, was just the, the distraction. <laughs> no, I wasn't offended. <laughs> I was just like, you know, like. Whatsoever. Yeah. Part of life. 
and the, the power of that particular language may not be as 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 powerful as it once was. No, oh, my virgin ears were fine. <laughs> <laughs> The whole thing of, hey, let's Mike a dude. Let's interview him while the playoff game is going on. Can you imagine it's the NBA Finals? And there's, I don't know, Jimmy Butler talking to Mike Breen, all the while LeBron James is taking him to the rim. Yeah. They biked up LeBron for part of one playoff game, didn't they? It was... It's, it's but fun to do the, NBA, uh, the NFL film style when you have the mic on the guy and then after the game you say, let's share with you all that they're talking about. But when the broadcaster's like, so how you doing? How's it going? Huh? That's why you have like a second, second delayed, isn't it? You know, you can, you can <laughs> leave them out. So I, it's the way the world is, you know, it, I, I can't get too head up over it. Kevin, how are your picks doing? Um, I was a game out in the pool I was in. Um, they didn't, they weren't doing particularly well. Um, although I did have Tampa and the Yankees and I had the Cubs, which was serious mistake. Sorry, Mick. Um, and I still have, Tam I still have a path to the world series matchup which is where the money is really made. So, um, although Giancarlo Stanton is not helping my Tampa choice along any, any, any too much. Thank you. Um, but it's been an entertaining. Did you watch the games yesterday? The Yankees were very entertaining. Mm -hmm. They have an entertaining team, and they're taking on a Rays team that basically is saying, we're going to throw wave after wave of pitcher at you, pitchers that you generally don't know. If you hit them, you beat us. If you don't hit them, we'll beat you. And the Yankees hit them. Mick, what were your expectations going into the playoffs? Well, I mean, I, I was hoping that the Cubs would have a better run than they did. And, you know, like, I guess after – Looking back now, you know, I remember as a kid, the 83 Orioles won the World Series. And then, you know, you, you eventually that team was dismantled and, you know, and, and all the pieces were gone. And you know, I was wondering, like, you know, wonder why they didn't win another World Series. You know, they, they were so good for a long time and they got to the World Series in 79 and then 83. And they almost got there in 82. They almost got to the playoffs. And, you know, 84, they were a pretty good team. But now I see it's just like, you know, guys just they just get worse. You know, I mean, like you get older, you get nicked up. Maybe you're hurt. Uh, maybe the league figures you out. Maybe you're too stubborn to change. Maybe you can't change. You know, I, I don't know. But I, I see this Cubs team being dismantled um, at some point. Right. I mean, if you go into the playoffs and you're playing the worst team in the, in the whole playoffs and you score one run, you know, like it's time to, to make some serious adjustments, especially when your payroll, the, the payroll can look at the two teams payroll. It's unbelievable. You know, the, the difference, the disparity, you know, and um, I get it. It's only two games. You know, would it have been different if it was three or four that you needed to win? I, I don't know, but I, I was pretty disappointed overall, you know, just as a Cubs fan, you know, that, that, that that's how the thing ended, you know, and um that I guess that's first. The, the second thing is that I've, I've said from the beginning that it's going to be the Yankees and the Dodgers. I've just kind of felt like that since day one. And nothing has really swayed me uh, besides the Yankees looking so bad there at one point during the 60 game season, but they've bounced back. And um, I just feel like they're going to steamroll the race and it's probably going to come down to the Yankees and the Astros. Right. So, um, but it's been fun, you know, like I, I enjoyed watching the Padres play, you know, I love the energy that they bring the A's come back to win that series against the White Sox. I thought that the White Sox gave, gave that game away, you know, and it's like, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Ricky Renteria, um, you know, and I mean, I don't know what they'll do, but, um, you know that that's a that's a game you got to win right there uh you know but but all in all like for for everything that's been involved in this COVID, um i got to give baseball credit i mean they've done a great job handling COVID. um i hope that we don't just all of a sudden adopt all these rules that i don't like but that work this year you know the runner at second base and extra innings the DH in the National League. I don't want to see 16 teams in the playoffs every year. I want the regular season to matter. But for what we've had to deal with this year, 
Um, I'd say baseball has done a really good job, and I think this is going to be an interesting postseason, you know, even with my Cubs out. How about the Twins and the Marlins being polar opposites? That the Twins make the playoffs every year and lose every game. And the Marlins never, ever, ever make it. But yeah. if they're in, don't play them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the Twins are, are built for, a, for an era that doesn't exist anymore. You know, the Marlins are built for youth and speed and the same with the Rays, a lot of pitching, a lot of, a lot of quick changes, a lot of changes on the fly. And meanwhile, the Twins are built for power and they're going to bring back Nelson Cruz, you know, great. You know, it's feast for famine. And uh, they're just not built for the playoffs. And I think there's a lot to be said for, uh, for what the Marlins have done. And, and despite the Yankees doing well, I think the Rays are built for the playoffs too in terms of having – you know, a gazillion arms out there that can flame throw for an inning and give way to someone else. And right now, you know, I, I, I'm with Mick. I think it'll be fascinating to see the Yankees and the Rays, how, how it turns out, especially if Stanton's finally woken up and uh, some of the other Yankees. And the Cubs are sort of the same way as the Twins are kind of old, too. I mean, maybe Chris Bryant coming back wasn't the best move Theo made this offseason. Well, I mean, I, I think they – Honestly, I think they would have moved him had he not had the grievance. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, and and had to go through all that stuff because, you know, he would have had an extra year of, you know, of of control with the team. And so if they get – if he doesn't – I mean, his value is going to be a lot lower right now just because of the years involved. And I think Chris can be one of the best players in baseball again. I'm not sure what the, what the issue was, but it just didn't feel like I was watching Chris Bryant this year. No, it could be nagging injuries. Yeah. And honestly, it could just be age and tired and maybe he needs a really another crappy op season with a one-year contract to work his way into, into better shape and get that right. contract. Well, I think maybe he's got the, you know, the, the shoulder injury that bothered him two years ago. I mean, th- those are – you know, you lose a little bit of loft on those fly balls, and it's, you know, and obviously it's a, it's a difference maker. You know, maybe he heals up. I remember Jim Palmer talking about being injured and looking like his career was over, and then all of a sudden he just got healthy, and all of a sudden he was throwing gas again, and it was like he had a second life, you know. The, the Jim Palmer after the 66 World Series, and then all of a sudden, you know, here's a guy that pitched in World Series games and got wins in World Series games, which I think is the only time it's ever happened in three different decades because he got a win in 66. He got a win in, you know, in 70, somewhere in the seventies, probably multiple world series. And then, um, you know, he got, he got a win in 83. So, uh, you know, but, but I remember, I think maybe I read it in his book or heard him talking about it. I, I don't know why, but I remember specifically knowing that he had gotten hurt and his arm healed and, 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 you know, and, so maybe that'll be the deal with Chris Bryant. Maybe just, you know, enough time off. It's a short, you know, it ha- maybe that's what, what it's going to be. But if it doesn't get any better, he still has had a phenomenal career if it ends after next season or something, you know, or if this season. Not to say it will, but you know, remember, this guy's Palmer, been amazing. He, What's he that? Was, he, one thing about Palmer, he was, he was devoted to being in shape. I mean, he was yeah. – I mean, he's doing underwear commercials uh, late in his career. And I, I've never been in the, the Cubs clubhouse when Chris Bryant was there. So I couldn't tell you if he's as committed to, uh, to academic, to, to athletic excellence as Jim Palmer was. Are so. you saying where are Chris Bryant's underwear commercials? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, seen, yeah, Mick, tell us your honest. I, <laughs> I've seen Chris Bryant do express commercials. There's a, there was a giant billboard next to Wrigley field. Look, I, I think that, I think that, um, you know, Chris Bryant has dedicated himself to to playing baseball he loves the game you know I mean it's easy to see that when when he's there um I'm looking at this year more as an anomaly you know like something you know something just wasn't right you know and I don't think it was a swing issue it, the, the ball just didn't seem to carry like it normally does for him it made solid contact it just didn't go out you know they were fly balls so you know maybe that's something that that changes but I mean you know, he's, there's not a better guy in the game, you know, and someone that you pull for more. But at the same time, if you're the front office and you got, you know, 20 million in him and you got Baez and you got Rizzo and you got this guy and that guy and this guy, and you got to pay everybody. 
you know, how are they going to do that? And then the other, you know, just talking Cubs is, is that Theo Epstein's contract is also up next year. And, you know, if, if, if he's, if I'm the Cubs and he's not coming back, I probably let him out of that contract right now and, and, and start to rebuild again, because you, you know, you don't want someone making decisions that, that isn't going to be there when those decisions are finished. Right. It's like, it's like the job and, and not to say, I mean, the guy's the best ever. Right. But he, you know, he broke two curses, but it's also a business thing. Like, look, if, if I own a business and my manager has already like, is it, we don't know if he's coming back or we think he's going to retire, just go ahead and move on and start over again. You know? So I think that's gotta be a decision too. Um, you know, it, I've, I've heard, you know, just listening to different shows and I, and I, I don't know, have any sources on this, but you know, Hey, maybe, maybe, uh, Theo to the, to the Mets or maybe Theo here, or maybe Theo there, you know, like, I don't know. He may retire. He may stay for another 20 years, but if he's not coming back, then they need to go ahead and, and, you know, thank him for his time and, you know, and honor him in the Cubs hall of fame or something. And, and get somebody that's going to be there long term because there's a lot of big decisions that they're going to have to make. Well, that was the Sun Times story this morning, basically. That have to do with and player personnel. I mean, the Sun Times this morning, basically, yeah, I didn't read that. Was saying I'm ready to go, you know, sort of hinting that he wouldn't mind a buyout, um, laying the groundwork to leave. Well, that's when you're ready to go. You're absolutely right. You go. That's it. And he's been awesome. And he's been awesome. You know. And, and I'm sure that he'll see this because he sees everything. He's got, like, there's, like, 10 Theos. Um, yeah, that's Jesse. And that's Kevin. Now, look, it, when, when it comes to people who are very successful, they're sometimes once they kind of get to what they're doing, their interest level wanes. And, it's on, and for them to kind of be their best, you know, they need to go to the next thing and, and, and start over again, you know. And that, that we saw that with – when he left Boston, it was a great fit for the Cubs, but it's a different organization now and he's a different person. So I don't know. I'm just going back to, you know, there's going to be a new look to this organization on the field, I think next year. And, and who knows, maybe in the front office too. Uh, and if it's not at this year, it'll be the next year, I'm guessing, unless he signs a long-term contract. Well, the curses are still out there, uh, right? So he, he broke Boston's, he broke the Cubs. Should Cleveland bring him in? Like, which team should say? Yeah, the Cleveland Browns. The, the, <laughs> the thing about Theo is he works well when he has a big budget. You know, yeah. it, you know, it, it really is. And right now, Chicago won't have a big budget because their whole economic model is based on not only Wrigley, but Wrigleyville as well. And Wrigleyville is suffering just as much as the Cubs did this offseason. So it, it – there's not going to be big budgets in, in Theo's future, even if he sticks around. On that note, shall we get into some lingo, shall we? Yes. Some yes, let's do it. Verbiage. All right, so I've got my baseball thesaurus right here. I've also got my football thesaurus right here because it's football season. And my thinking is to go right into the balls used by each sport. I've got... Uh, when it comes to baseball, it's a horse hide, right? Or it's a cow hide. It's the all apple. Mick, do you have a favorite term for a baseball? Here comes the pill. And you can see it, especially <laughs> like a fastball. The faster the fastball, the smaller it is. It's absolutely a pill. Yeah, yeah, a pill. <laughs> An aspirin tablet. Yeah. Uh, have, it's right. called a seed, especially if it's thrown really hard or if it's hit yeah, really seed. hard. Yeah, yeah, right. Or if it's hit hard, yeah. Football is, I mean, the classic is the pigskin. Um, but one of my favorite terms for a football is a loaf of bread. And it's described as a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. If you ever see a ball carrier holding it away from him, like you'd carry a loaf of bread, not actually tucked into the body, then the announcer has to criticize the guy for saying he's holding it like a loaf of bread which is why every coach gets on the back of every player who does it now. So you actually see it less. You used to see it a lot in the 70s, mm -hmm. early. Yes. You know, that flamboyant tossing it around. And now, boy, I was watching, watching one of the NFL games. And even in a situation where there's no tacklers around, and you saw guys holding it like this. 
just as tight as they could get. I remember when yeah. Why don't I think Walter Payton? Go ahead. Yes, sweetness would absolutely hold it. I was going to say, I mean, like, yeah, like, he just, like, you say that, and I can just see him, you know, ripping through the Vikings defense with that foot. Oh, sorry, Kevin, I'm not talking about your Vikings. I, you know, ripping through the Redskins defense and or Washington's defense, which is going to – it's like when we change the DL to the IL, I'm just like, look, please forgive me because I'm. it's going to take me months to get this right, you know. Uh, going through the – the, the, the defense of the Washington team back when they were called the Redskins, holding the football out like this, and, and they didn't drop it. That was the ma- amazing thing. Like, how did he not drop the football? Well, number one, those guys had strong hands. Walter Payton's hands were strong. And the other thing I remember when about it came that football defenses were taught that one guy was to hold up the ball carrier – so that the teammates could come in and strip the ball out. And up mm-hmm. until that point, if somebody had the ball, you just tried to tackle him. And then there, the peanut punch, right? Charles Tillman able to punch that football right out of a player's possession. Being able to strip a guy from the ball, being able to dispossess him with it, the old strip sack fumble or whatever it might be, that is a relatively new occurrence. It's also an analytics thing, by the way. The analytics showed that, yeah, you may give up three or four more yards on a run if you, if you do it that way, but your chances of causing a fumble are so much greater that it outweighs those three or four yards per run. You'll see a receiver make a catch, and then the cornerback will come around the corner and just start tearing at the football. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, it's pretty wild how that's changed. And, yeah, I remember when Tiki Barber had all of his fumbling issues for the New York Giants. And the entire week, he had to hold the football. There have been other guys, college level, wherever it is, where the coach sends the guy around campus holding the football to make sure that he never, ever fumbles. Mm. So, loaf of bread, pigskin, baseball, the old horse eye, the old cow hide, depending upon what material it was made with over the years. But, yeah, I love Mick. As you said, it's a pill. It's the old <laughs> apple. That's a mm-hmm. good So there's our lingo. Boom, boom. Baseball thesaurus, football thesaurus, available through August publications, as is because today is book day, Kevin. The Complete Guide to Spring Training 2021. Woo! Florida, telling you all about how you're going to have to deal with ballparks with the COVID still going on. But the plan is for spring training. Everyone's laying in supplies. There's meetings going on. I saw a video one the other day. So they're planning it. Any final thoughts, Mick? No, congratulations, though, Kevin. I mean, you know, just trying to do a book myself. It's a lot of hard work. And, um, you know, today's that day you look forward to when you put all that work in. So good luck with uh, the sales. And for those of you watching, make sure you support Kevin and, and get your copy. And hopefully really soon and by next spring training, that we'll need that book because we'll be able to go back to games again. Subscribe to the Ballpark Digest newsletter if you haven't already. Kevin Reichardt, any final thoughts? No, I'm just really exhausted because putting out a book, as you you know, (laughs) Jesse, is just a whole bunch of stress and anxiety wrapped up in exhaustion. So uh, I'm I'm glad it's out. On to the next project and on to the projects for the spring. I'll give it as my final thought. Just we lost another baseball great in Bob Gibson. Mm. We've lost a lot of baseball greats recently over the years. Ron Paranofsky recently passed away as well. But, I mean, Bob Gibson after Lou Brock, after Tom Seaver, after uh, we've lost a lot of really great baseball players. And Gibby is noted for that 1968 dominant season. But what a career. What a pitcher. You can look at the video. You can watch Gibby work. And, my goodness, what a dominant pitcher he was. Plus, he could hit. He played basketball for the Globetrotters. Mm. Read about his life. This has been the Ballpark Digest broadcaster chat. From Mick Gillespie and Kevin Reichardt, I'm Jesse Goldberg-Strassler, and thank you.